Well, our thanks to Arena Theater this morning and throughout these President's Chapels uh, for delivering God's Word to us. My thanks to you for your prayers. Uh, COVID was pretty rough for me, I got to say. Uh, Full boosted or not, uh, I'm really glad to be back um, today, have an opportunity to proclaim God's word. Two other just quick notes. Um, last week was hospitality week. I was pleased to tune into those chapel services. An amazing opportunity for us to show hospitality to Bethel University on Saturday at noon at McCulley Stadium. Uh, our brothers and sisters will be here in force. Uh, let's welcome them in person then. And uh, also, um, my favorite Christian leader, I think I want to say this, my favorite Christian leader will be with us uh, for chapel on Wednesday um, through remote link up in uh, California, home in her wheelchair, not able to travel. Johnny Erickson Tata will be here. Greg Waybright will interview her. Um, really looking forward to chapel on Wednesday. Uh, but now we have Jeremiah 20 to deal with. It's quite a passage. Uh, you may not have read this 16th century lyric, but you probably do know the title. It's from the Spanish mystic, St. John of the Cross. He was wrestling with the soul's journey to God, recognizing that often God seems to be shrouded in darkness. And eventually he called his poem, Dark Night of the Soul. It's a phrase that has captured people's imaginations. English majors might know it from T.S. Eliot's Four Quartets. It's often been set to music, Moby, Van Morrison, Mayhem, Depeche Mode saying it this way, it's the dark night of my soul and temptations taking hold, but through the pain and suffering, through the heartache and trembling, I feel loved. Same phrase is in Stephen King's Insomnia, F. Scott Fitzgerald, even Douglas Adams, the cartoonist, after he was done with The Far Side, wrote a sci-fi novel called The Long Dark Tea Time of the Soul. He knew this phrase as well. And I think there's a simple reason why this phrase has captured people, why they remember it, why they say it again. We all have dark nights of the soul. Yes, Even leading authors and Grammy Award winning songwriters. We all come eventually to a place of spiritual crisis and although it can happen during the daytime, often it happens during the dark hours of the night when we are alone with our thoughts and wonder. Is God there? Does he care? I think perhaps apart from our savoring, Savior's sufferings on the cross, the clearest biblical example of this comes from Jeremiah 20. Let me just give you briefly the backstory. The prophet had been imprisoned. Uh, a man named Pasher, who was sort of the head of temple security, self-appointed prophecy police took exception to Jeremiah's message of judgment against Jerusalem. And so he seized the prophet, beat him, and then bound him. Yes. Then he had a change of heart and he released Jeremiah. And the next morning, the prophet opened a window to his soul. I think these are his thoughts and feelings from that long, dark night. He had been up all night. And in the light of a new day, he began to lament everything that was wrong with his life. Oh, Lord, he says, you have deceived me and I was deceived. You are stronger than I am and you have prevailed. And the prophet had a lot of reasons to be discouraged. He was in danger. People didn't like his message. Uh, people were trying to catch him in some kind of false prophecy so that they could stone him. Apparently, enemy priests were gathering in corners of the temple. They were pointing accusatory fingers at him. He could hear them whispering, denounce him. Let's denounce him. Say all my, not enemies, my close friends, they're watching for my fall. Even those close friends were hoping he would make some false move. He had been beaten. He had been put in prison. There had been death threats, many of them. And now he wondered what they would do to him next. 
and people were mocking him. I've become a laughingstock. Everyone mocks me. And the reason is because he's speaking God's word. And because of that word, he is an object of public derision. You, you get the sense that Jerusalem's late night comedians were getting some of their best material at Jeremiah's expense. His ministry had become a punchline. There goes that crazy old prophet. Did you hear what he did yesterday? That verbal abuse may not seem like much compared to a vicious beating, but public ridicule takes its toll. Jeremiah was despised and rejected. And even his closest of all friends seem to have betrayed him. Oh Lord, you deceived me and I was deceived. Apparently, Jeremiah was starting to doubt whether God's word was true, which, as we have seen, is Satan's oldest temptation. God compelled the prophet to prophesy, and he prophesied, but where was the judgment that God had promised? And the longer God waited before fulfilling his word, the more Jeremiah wondered whether he had become a false prophet. I think in one way or another, most of us can relate, even if we are not prophets, and even if we don't go quite as far as Jeremiah did and malign the character of Almighty God. But we too, have we not understood God to say he would do something for us, and then it didn't seem like he did it? People mocked us or criticized us. We felt like fools for believing about what the Bible says is true about Jesus. We Sometimes life was so hard, we wondered whether everything we heard about the gospel was true. And in those dark nights of the soul, when we cried out to God, we weren't even sure that he was listening. In his memoir, Telling Secrets, the late novelist Frederick Buechner poses some of the doubtful questions that most Christians ask, whether sooner or later. And surely you will have picked up that one of my purposes this year is to normalize the hard questions we have about Christianity. Here's how Beekner poses them. Is the Lord indeed at hand? Many of us have believed in him for a long time, have also hungered to believe in him when with part of ourselves, we sometimes couldn't believe in much of anything. And in the midst of a suffering world and of our own small suffering, we have tried to believe in a God of love and power, the highest power beyond all others. Have we been right? Is it finally true what we have believed and hungered to believe? Jeremiah had similar questions. He wrestled with them during his dark night of the soul. And I think his poem shows the single most important thing that we can do when we have our doubts about God's loving care. And that is simply this, talk to God about it. Yeah, yeah. Whatever doubts we have in the darkness, we should take them to the Lord in prayer. Psalm uh, Jeremiah 20 here is, a, is the psalm of a suffering believer. Maybe you can picture Jeremiah. He's a prophet in solitary confinement, weakened with physical pain from his beatings, exhausted by emotional turmoil, fearful of what tomorrow might bring. Now hear the first words out of his mouth. They are an invocation to Almighty God. Oh Lord, the prophet cries. Oh Lord, God always invites him to take our troubles straight to him. It's what godly people have done all through history. It's what Job did when he was out on the ash heap. It's what the psalmist did again and again. It's what Jonah did in the belly of the great fish. It's, it's even what Jesus did on the cross when he was suffering for our sins, felt separated from his loving father. My God, he cried out. My God, my God. Even when we think God is the problem, and not the solution, which is, I think, what er Jeremiah thought. Even when we think he is implicated in our negative experiences, we should talk things over with him. There's never any reason for us to hide our feelings. We can always take our struggles to the Lord in prayer. 
And what I mean by prayer is not some formal liturgy. It's just telling God exactly what you're thinking and feeling the way that Jeremiah did. Now, as the prophet did this, something amazing happened. And our readers this morning picked up on it by putting that part of his uh, poem in unison. Jeremiah suddenly began to take heart. Somehow the, the Holy Spirit was ministering to his soul. He, it's totally unexpected what happens in verse 13. He's been complaining up until this point, but he interrupts his complaint long enough to hold a short worship service, actually beginning in verse 11. He believed in that moment that God was against him, and yet he still offered this little psalm of praise to his God. And I think it gives us a second thing to do in our dark nights of the soul. However counterintuitive it may seem, worship again. Talk to God about it, worship again. This liturgy is short, but it's, it's really complete. It has a confession of faith, a petition for deliverance, a hymn of praise, all of that packed into just three little verses. The Lord is with me. Verse 11, that's his confession of faith. As a dread warrior, therefore my persecutors will stumble. They will not overcome me. Jeremiah really didn't understand what was happening. Even God seemed to be against him, and yet he still testified to what he believed deep down to be true about the character of his Savior. God seemed to be far away, but Jeremiah believed he was there. He felt powerless, but knew that God was strong. He expected his enemies not to gain the, the victory, but to be triumphed over by the grace of God. And so the prophet testifies, he confesses that God will be his salvation. I wonder what is your confession of faith? Not, not simply the creed that you may recite, but the confidence you live by. Are you able to say, in spite of all troubles, that God is with you like a mighty warrior? Jeremiah believed this, and because he believed it, he was willing to ask for help. There's a petition here, a cry for deliverance. O Lord of hosts, you see the heart and the mind. Let me see your vengeance. To you I have committed my cause. I won't take time to develop it, but I think it's important that when Jeremiah doubted, he did not try to solve his problems on his own. But he committed his whole situation to God. For him, that included prayer that he would be vindicated. He thought it was unjust the way he was being treated. Our case may be different from that, but the principle is the same. If we believe that God is with us and has the power to help us, we should ask him for the help that only he can give. Jeremiah, despite his doubts, began to believe in that so strongly, he actually closed his worship time with a hymn of praise. I'm reminded of Paul and Silas in prison. Sing to the Lord, praise the Lord, for he has delivered the life of the needy from the hand of evildoers. Maybe it's what he prayed the following morning. Maybe he was so confident of God's help, he actually could put it in the past tense. But he prays for himself as the needy one, and he praises God for his deliverance. Maybe not even having the breath bent over in the stocks as he was to sing some long anthem, but he could manage at least this short song of praise. And he comes through doubts to a place of such confidence that he praises God during his dark night of the soul. I'm reminded of the famous prayer of Dietrich Bonhoeffer, imprisoned also for the sake of God's word, going through his dark night of the soul in a Nazi concentration camp. He did not stop praising God, but worshiped, worshiped again. Here's what Bonhoeffer wrote, in me there is darkness, but with thee, Lord, there is light. I am lonely, but thou leavest me not. I'm, I'm restless, but with thee there is peace. In me there is bitterness, but with thee there is patience. Thy ways are past understanding, but thou knowest the way for me. Yes. It's always good to praise the Lord, even 
when we have our doubts about his loving care. During one of my own dark nights, I wrote this song expressing some of my thoughts and feelings. The opening stanza starts, ends with a question. Jesus, hear me in the darkness. Hear this dying sinner's plea. All I've done is empty, worthless. There is nothing good in me. Lonely in my desperation, will you come and rescue me? Notice that these words are a prayer, a prayer put in the form of praise. I think the best thing to do when we are discouraged, doubtful, maybe depressed, is to keep confessing, keep praying, keep singing. Even when we have a complaint to make, we can still confess our faith in Jesus, pray for deliverance, and then start to praise his name. Now, it's tempting to stop there this morning. In fact, it was really tempting for Arena Theater to do that. Did you notice? They got to the end of verse 13, and that, that seemed like the end. They started to walk off, and then there was more. In fact, they reached out to wonder, uh, well, how do we put this together? Like, Because usually, when we're in a Christian context, we, we wrestle a bit with the difficulty, but we get to a place of resolution, and then we let it go. But that's not the way Jeremiah 20 is. We, we take the Bible as it comes, and this time, spoiler alert, it's a huge downer. Before the prophets last, the note of his last praise song has even faded away. He tells us that he just wants to die. Cursed be the day on which I was born. Cursed the man who brought that news. These are some of the bitterest, maybe the bitterest curses in the Bible. We're, we're at a point we thought Jeremiah had overcome his doubts. He, and yet here, and I like the way our own philosophy prof Mark Talbot writes about this. He describes this as an absolute crisis of faith that plunges the prophet into life-cursing despair. That's the low point for Jeremiah. And he does some of the same things that we're tempted to do when life goes against us. You blame God, you reject your calling, maybe even curse the day that you were born. Jeremiah is not celebrating his birthday. He wants to reach back into history and damn anything and everyone that had anything to do with that birth. And in particular, this man who brought his father the good news, he should have, been, he should have strangled the child instead. I mean, what do you make of that? How do you put that together? You've got a, a, a psalm of high praise followed by a cry of utter despair. Some scholars say, oh, this doesn't really belong together. It's just like things pulled from one place and another. But even if you were just pulling things together, would you pull them together like this? I think really the only explanation for it is that Jeremiah's curses follow his praises because that's the way it was during that long, dark night of the soul. Who says the life of the soul is always logical? Sometimes prayer doesn't make everything all better right away. It actually, in a way, seems to make things worse. And sometimes we do go from complaining to praying and praising to cursing. And the Bible doesn't shy away from this, even in the lives of the greatest saints. Praise God. Praise God the Bible is like this. I'm reminded of the testimony of Wheaton alumnus Andrew Brunson, who for his testimony of faith in Christ languished in a Turkish prison for 735 days, count them, many of them in solitary confinement. Brunson says, my two years in prison were marked by what I would call the silence of God, not having any sense of his presence. To have that intimacy removed led to a fence around my heart toward God. I broke physically, I broke emotionally, I went into that spiritual crisis. This is the testimony of my Wheaton classmate. We were on the same floor in Fisher together. And whether they are missionaries or prophets or just ordinary Christians, people who go through dark nights of the soul ask 
the question that comes at the end of this chapter. This is a chapter that ends not with an answer, but with a question. Did you notice that? Why did I come out of the womb to see, see toil and sorrow and spend my days in shame? It, this dark night of soul put a huge question mark over Jeremiah's existence. And not surprisingly, physical torture, public humiliation, the rejection of his ministry, a sense of God's absence. I mean, it would make you wonder why you had ever been born. Jeremiah just wanted to quit, which is what many people in ministry do or want to do. One recent study reported that more than 60% of all Christian leaders give up, far too early lose their faith, mess up, and fall deep, that's their testimony. I think we find hope in the fact that even though Jeremiah 20 ends with a question mark, it's not the Bible's last word. Amen. By definition, if you're in a dark night of the soul, you can't see the light. You wouldn't still be in the dark night of the soul if you could. But it doesn't mean that morning's not going to dawn. I think it's striking that Jeremiah 21 begins with a fresh word from God. The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. We don't know when, but it did come. And this prophet who had to live for a while with the questions also lived to preach another day. He's the prophet of hope for the nations. He's the prophet of justice. who was quoted earlier this morning from chapter 22. His ministry went forward. He's the one who testified the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. That's Jeremiah. Andrew Brunson testifies that in his first year of confinement, he couldn't sing, great is thy faithfulness. He tried, he couldn't do it. He was too wounded. But eventually God did put a song in his heart. It wasn't, it wasn't a breakthrough, he said, as much as it was a, a shifting that led to a rebuilding. Maybe that's what you need in your life. Maybe it's not gonna be a breakthrough, but a shifting that leads to a rebuilding. Brunson says on his part, it was his decision to lay aside his conditions for God and his expectations for God and simply to say, whatever you do or don't do, do I will follow you. If, I, if you don't give your voice, I'll still follow. If you don't give me your presence, I'll still follow. If you don't set me free, I'll still be faithful. I'm gonna fight for my relationship with you and choose to turn my eyes toward you rather than away from you. Brunson says that in his weakness, he knew that he might only be able to turn slightly in God's direction, but even if he turned one degree, it would make all the difference in the world, one degree towards God as opposed to one degree away from God. And I think our Savior did the same thing when he was crucified. And there was a giant question mark hanging over the cross. My God, my God, that's how his prayer began. Why have you forsaken me? Question mark, that's how it ended. There was no answer from heaven. Jesus had to live with that question and die with it too because he didn't really get the answer until three days later when he rose again. But it did get answered. Yes, sir. Dear doubter, dear believer, dear doubter believer, don't stop talking to God. Start worshiping again. And don't stop believing in the empty tomb. Amen. That'll have the last word. Lord, we want to let the resurrection have the last word this morning, that Jesus who died rose again. That's your answer to our sins. It's also your answer to our sufferings, that there is life to come. Lord, help all who doubt, strengthen faith, help us to pray, call us to worship, help us to believe again in Jesus' name. Amen.